Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fondation Bayler. As the director, it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all here. Uh, we are very pleased that you have come to this uh, conversation about the museum of the 21st century. Um, the fact that on the probably only sunny hour this summer in Switzerland, you're coming inside the museum. I look at it as a sign that the museum has a future. So <laughs> we have three extraordinary guests who are going to share their experience um, and going to discuss um, uh, today. Um, the Albright Knox is a museum, I don't know if all of you know it, especially European. It's one of the oldest and still contemporary art museum um, in the United States, a museum we deeply um, admire for, um, for its mission, also a fantastic collection, and uh, everyone who travels to the United States, I would highly recommend you to go and see the museum, even now, before its expansion, that it is working on. And um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce the director of the, um, of the Albright Knox, um, Janne Siren, the, uh, dear colleague and, and friend, originally from, from Finland, but um, now um, at the museum and uh, spearheading this very exciting project. Um, in the center, um, one of the most brilliant minds of our generation, a wonderful artist, Mark Bradford, who is um, currently um, exhibiting in the exhibition Shade, to get his work together with Clifford Still at the Albright Knox. Um, he is also the founder of art and practice in Los Angeles, a um, fascinating project in his community. And um, Mark, we're all looking forward to that uh, you're going to show your work uh, representing the United States at the next uh, Venice Biennial. Um, the architect that has been chosen in the selection process to, um, to actually design um, the expansion of the old bike Knox is uh, Shoi Shigematsu um, from um, OMA. Um, famous office, he's, he's the head of, of, of the Oma office in the United States, and um, we're really looking forward to your conversation. Thank you all for joining, and um, we are curious what you're going to say. <laughs> so I think I'm going to stand for a few moments as to kind of kick off the process. First of all, I want to say warm greetings from Buffalo and Western New York, known for its fine weather and excellent art collection. <laughs> <laughs> the Albright Knox is about an intergenerational dialogue. We are one of the oldest museums in the United States, as Sam mentioned, established in 1862 in the middle of the Civil War. The building you're looking at dates from 1905. This is the opening ceremony back in May of 1905, designed by E.B. Green and a famous American architect. And this is an, sort of an aerial view of this neoclassical edifice surrounded by a beautiful park, not unlike the one that surrounds us here uh, at the Fondation Bayler. In 1962, at the height of the modernist era, Gordon Bunshaft designed an expansion for the museum, which you see over there, uh, keeping himself sort of at an arm's length from the marble edifice uh, that had been there since 1905. Here's Nelson Rockefeller and one of our great patrons, Seymour H. Knox Jr., uh, discussing the new building, the new future for uh, the city of Buffalo. And here's an interesting slide that tells you a little bit about our evolution as an art museum, but also the evolution of contemporary art museums in general. You can see that you know, we start with only a few works back here in you know, the early 1900s. After World War II, we are at somewhere you know, 1,300 works and then the graph shoots up. And we are not alone uh, in, in this kind of a progression, of course, in the world of museums. We have an extraordinary collection of which we are very proud. We are custodians of this national and global treasure. Uh, we have works uh, that are of an older vintage, really sort of 
textbook examples of modern art ranging from uh, Giacomo Balla's Dinamismo de un cane uh, to fantastic works by Gauguin and, and uh, other artists. And of course, we are really well known for our collection of abstract uh, expressionist works as well as uh, works by other uh, post-war artists. We have, we, until the Clifford Still Museum opened in Denver about uh, three, four, was it five years ago already? We were the largest uh, collection of Clifford Stills in the world, 33 works. With the opening of the Clifford Still Museum, they are, they are now the largest uh, holder of his artistic legacy, but uh, it's an important part um, of our collection, and it sort of scores, uh, underscores, and highlights uh, the fact that we are 100% dedicated to be an artist-centric institution. That's why Mr. Clifford Still gave uh, 31 works to us back in uh, 1964. Uh, we also believe that a museum should really work with the community and in the community. We believe in the notion that art has a transformative power. Uh, so we have started new initiatives, such as a public art initiative that enables us to put artworks all around Western New York, not just within the museum walls. And uh, we serve the community also by giving educational opportunities to children from all different types of walks of life from different uh, parts uh, of Western New York and even Canada, Southern Ontario, about 18,000 creative thinkers of tomorrow go through our uh, halls uh, each year. When we uh, decided to embark on a process uh, of uh, expansion, what we decided that we would do is not just build more space for the sake of art, but we wanted uh, to build uh, a process that would enable us to choose not a design, but to choose a partner, someone with whom we could uh, collaboratively design uh, the future uh, of our institution and at the same time participate in the sort of renaissance that these Rust Belt cities, such as Buffalo, Pittsburgh, and other cities in that part of the United States are currently experiencing. Of course, we wish to show more of our collection. We are able to show about 2% at, uh, at this time, uh, but we also want to build spaces that will engage the community. And we want to return more green space to the museum campus. A, a parking lot is not always the nicest thing that you wish to encounter uh, as you enter uh, a space uh, of art. And now I'm going to show you a few pictures uh, from an exhibition that we currently have at the museum, an exhibition that really kind of tells you the story of what the Albright Knox is about. We work and have worked since our foundation in 1862 collaboratively with artists. We were founded by living artists uh, back in the 1860s, and ever since then we've worked together with artists to realize projects. And often these projects involve intergenerational dialogues. There might be a contemporary artist asking questions about today and tomorrow, but somehow always uh, sort of uh, excavating the question of what it means to look to the future through understanding of the past. So in this exhibition, one of the greatest artists and thinkers of our time, Mark Bradford, is in a conversation with Clifford Still. The exhibition was curated by Dr. Kathleen Chaffee, our senior curator who's here uh, with us tonight, uh, this evening. And uh, there's a catalog uh, that you can find in the bookstore over here if you wish to read more about this particular show. But it, it sort of tells you the story of this show, but also uh, uh, of the DNA, the artistic DNA of the, of the Albright Knox. Uh, here you see a few views of our 1905 building and then glimpses into the spaces where Mark's uh, works are shown. Now Clifford Still was an artist who really did not, was not really so interested in collaborations and he really defined himself as a, as, as a Still and a Clifford and in whichever word, order you wish to pose those words. So for Kathleen to come up with this notion of, of this exhibition where where Clifford Still is welcomed into a posthumous conversation, if you wish, with a thinker from today was, that, that was a brave move. Art museums in the world today need to be brave. We need to do things that allow democracy to play itself out. We need to be spaces where difficult questions can be asked safely. And, and that's one of the things that we aspire to do. So when we invited uh, uh, Mark 
to work with us, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about the specific works in a moment, but it was also an invitation to let uh, us, in a sense, investigate how an intergenerational dialogue is possible with uh, the abstract art of the 1950s and how it resonates with the social issues and questions that we're dealing in our world today. Because as, uh, as an art historian whom I greatly admire, Linda Nochlin once said, all art is political in one way or another, even the non-figurative. This is what defines us as a museum. So then, when we embarked um, on this quest uh, of architecture, it was really very important for our board of directors, many of whom are here, a visionary group of leaders, as well as the, the staff team, to really say that we do not want to run a conventional design competition. We don't just want to invite designs and then pick one. But we want to um, run a process that enables us to choose a partner at the end of it. So we posed design challenges uh, to five architects, and they all had to answer to those design challenges with renderings and whatnot. But uh, we, what we kept telling to the decision makers is that while you see these responses to the design challenges that we've issued, we're not going to build any of that. You kind of have to edit it out of your mind, forget about it, and just think of that as an intellectual flexing of the mind that you're seeing. But what you need to choose is the best partner for us. The hardest job I've had as a museum director was making the four phone calls to the four other finalists who did not make it uh, to here tonight. Uh, because all of them put their hearts and minds uh, to this process. All of them wanted to be a part of this journey. And I think that as we celebrate and, and look to the future, it's always important also to remember that not all projects come to a fruition. And there is a lot of effort that remains unseen by the greater public. And uh, so this is a salute, I suppose, to all the efforts that have been put into building the future of the Albright Knox, but of any institution. And I know that Sam and his team and his uh, amazing board of directors here at the Fundacion Baylor is in, in, sort of in a parallel process with us. They are also seeking a partner, uh, and they are seeking to honor this intergenerational dialogue with an existing campus. Uh, and they are uh, looking to the past at the same time as they are looking to the future while their feet uh, are in the today. And I guess that's all I want to say, and now I'm going to shut up <laughs> and, and let the real rock stars uh, uh, of, of the evening speak. Uh, and perhaps we can begin with that notion of what it means, uh, Mark, as an artist to be engaged you know, with this notion of an intergenerational dialogue. Intergenerational, in the sense of, uh, in this case, uh, no. You have the, you have the, um, you have the space or the site to be able to um, interrogate that history. I mean, I can sort of move back into sort of think about 1950s and sort of the dominating ideas and be able to unpack that and reanimate it and look at it from a different site. I mean, I'm a black gay male, very different than Clifford Steele. I couldn't even be in the same room with Clifford Still. So I find that kind of interesting to be able to cast light, reposition, interrogate, and unpack. I think that that's what makes kind of the 21st century and being a contemporary artist interesting. So that's why I decided that I really wanted to have this dialogue because it's, it's funny though because it's for some reason we just we just walk around like the 1950s we've kind of deconstructed it as bad and just walk around it eh, why not go into it and like unpack it and move the furniture around and you know so that's what I really got from that show the ch the, the chance to do that but that's a question that you've asked for a long time I mean yeah, sure. I think it would be interesting to hear a little bit about how you engage that dialogue with, with abstract expression and expressionism to begin with? Well, I, I was fascinated with um, the fact that 1950s New York and kind of Emmett Till, the kind of civil rights movement around the same time. I mean, Jackson Pollock on the cover of Life magazine and kind of early civil rights were around the same time. But I felt that so much of this kind of New York school, the kind of politics around it were kind of pushed to the side more, this kind of 
they, instead of looking out at kind of the, de, the dismantling of America, often based, a lot of what's happening now is, a, is kind of this, dis, this disruption of kind of policies are going on. They just chose to look in. Sort of all the sort of all the kind of big white males looked in, and I think that might have been a response to if they looked out, they might have been horrified at what was going on in the streets, what was going on in civil rights and women's rights, and it was all bubbling. Yeah. So I found that really interesting, and actually to come to that space and to look out and to kind of question the fabric of society, it's just a different gaze looking at that that history from a different viewpoint. And maybe maybe making it and, and putting the politics back. I mean, it was the fifties. The fifties are the fifties. It was a little bit more than Mad Men, you know. It's a little bit more than that. I mean, uh, women's rights weren't even on the table. I mean, if you look at something like Mad Men, I mean, she, they're they're just like hangers for all the males' policies. So it's it's to put the to put it back in the political context of the time. I found exciting and shade actually came from Paris's burning. And Shade um, Clifford still he was um, he had these category. I mean, he named a, that was a big thing in the sort of abstract it was to name number everything. These right. numerical systems of order. Yeah. So I looked around for another numerical system of order. And, and Paris is burning. They had all of these different categories for drag. Right. And um, so actually, Shade is it's just a, um, Shade means to give up. Oh, I like your shoes, but you really don't like her shoes. It's just like a, you know, throwing shade, a reed. Uh, I snapped my fingers, but you couldn't hear it because I'm not close to the. But it's just kind of this. Um, I used another numerical system, a new, another system that um, divides, and sh uh, so all of the the language around and the, the titles come from categories and basically vogue ball. Drag, opulence, uh, duck walk. That I think that's no, that's Butch Queen. Actually, that painting that's, is that's called Butch, Butch Queen. Queen. That is a category when men try to pass as being Butch, which means being undetectable, mm -hmm. as being gay, like I'm doing now on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? But um, so this idea of um, I thought of things that pass, things that present themselves as one thing and actually trying to mm. kind of occupy another space. In some ways, I almost, look at, I almost look at the whole kind of moment of the 50s as being drag in a bit, a mm. bit of a way, and I think they were a little bit. <laughs> it's interesting, uh, for especially for us here now, that we are on the European continent where you also spend a good deal of time would you share a few thoughts about that, how traveling in Europe? Race plays, plays out different. Yeah. In the US, you're race first and then nationality, unless we have a war. And then everybody becomes very national. And then we go back to being race first. Mm. Whereas in Europe, it seems like they're very much aware that when I came to Europe, I was a North American. Yeah. That was the first, oh, you're North American. And I said, no, I'm black. <laughs> Because that's the way I was raised. I mean, we're black American, Hispanic American, Asian American. And so that was a very different, that was a very different mindset. Even the way that I navigated the city was very different because when I'm in the US, I'm very much aware that it's a black male walking in back of whoever I'm walking in back of. And there's a different dynamic. You can walk down the street and you can hear the cars lock. Lock, 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 <laughs> lock, lock. lock has nothing to do with me, Mark Bradford. It's just because of the narrative of race in the US. So it was freeing for me. As it was much more freeing to be as just a North American. I wasn't even that tall, because I spent a lot of time in Amsterdam, and the people are taller. So that wasn't even a big deal. So it was freeing. I was able to actually to have much more fluidity yeah. than, um, and I could kind of, for, not forget, but actually race did not walk in. And as a 20-year-old, that was, it was liberating. I mean, it was the 80s, so there was a huge right. AIDS crisis going on when so many people were dying, but it, it was, there was this kind of fluidity that I didn't have in the States. Mm. I, the first time I saw European abstraction before I saw the American school. Yep. Um, um, 
I was just introduced to it. It's funny. I went to European abstraction to um, to come to that American. Ameri I read about this more in school, so that was kind of interesting. Mm. And and museums were free, right? So I could wander through the European museums and the European museums. If they had a lot of American painting, they always had abstract expression. They always had a room full of American modernist abstract painting. So it's interesting. I kind of saw American painting through a, in a European museum, pointing back to this is what America was in the 50s. It's interesting, this point. Um, Shohei grew up uh, or spent part of your childhood in Boston, where his father was uh, teaching at MIT. Then the family returns to Japan. Uh, you go to an undergraduate school there, uh, and then graduate school in, Am uh, in Holland, uh, and then uh, your first job, uh, where you then made you know, your career, really, was uh, at OMA with uh, Rem Koolhaas, one of the you know, finest architectural minds uh, of our time. And I think it's interesting, Shohei and I had earlier today a conversation about his experience as uh, a Japanese working uh, architect working uh, in, in one of the most renowned architectural offices and now running OMA America, uh, or the OMA's uh, American operation, and really redefining the practice uh, that um, Rem started in the mid-1970s. So would you say perhaps a few words about your how, how your intergenerational dialogue, if you wish, uh, yeah, has played itself out. I think that uh, that slide that I had uh, well, it was kind of a confusing slide after beautiful paintings. Uh, <laughs> but um, this is the repertoire of museums I worked uh, with Rem, and some, some of them now uh, I worked without him. So uh, the, one of the first projects I led in OMA was the Whitney Museum Extension. And as you can see, it was a very kind of... Uh, ambitious, formally ambitious, and um, also construction-wise very ambitious, and also LACMA, which in the end didn't happen, and now uh, Peter Zintor is doing a similar uh, scale with like three times more budget. But, <laughs> but anyway, I think that Rem, Rem, I learned a lot, and I think that Rem... Was a re that was shade. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was shade. <laughs> and... Uh, Working with Rem was, of course, very rewarding, but um, he always, I thought, look, looking back, why we lost all these projects is that maybe he was a little bit too uh, competitive in the kind of artist and curator's domain and art's domain. So I, I kind of uh, used him as a, um, you know, a bad teacher to really redefine what my take to the uh, art museum, and I think the one that is opening next week in Quebec, and the one, it's a, a fine art forum in Miami Beach. Where I'm trying to have something much more neutral, but, uh, and that, that kind of experience came through collaboration with artists and so on. So, uh, as, as Yana is saying, I'm trying to, we, even though OMA has such a, of course, an image of REM, I'm trying to redefine with new energy, and I'm so glad that I'm able to work with also Yana and his team in, in such a rich context. And transgenerational, I, I guess that, that's, you know, that's how I kind of interpreting, even in the same office, Remis, I still see him, but you know, uh, trying to redefine the, the kind of old image into new. And I think that's, that's kind of a difficult thing. And I don't know what uh, Bunshaft actually thought, because Bunshaft was also SOM, individual within a collective yeah. office. So I think that, that kind of dialogue would be also quite interesting to me, too. Yeah. And the, your building has, of course, a very deliberate dialogue already with modern architecture and neoclassical building. And the modern architecture already s still stands as a kind of modern piece. So something to add on is, of course, uh, very difficult uh, because whatever we add already might look um, too similar to um, um, Bunshaft. Right, I think the dialogue is the, is the interesting question, both in terms of Mark's exhibition as well as these architectural endeavors that, that Sam and his team are engaged with here at the Byler as well as uh, now us at the, at the Albright Knox because, you know, in some ways, I guess, uh, 
and it's such a quotidian example in some ways, but when we think of the Bilbao, uh, the Guggenheim Bilbao Museum, you know, you have an, sort of an empty piece of land, uh, and then you are able to make an architectural gesture or sculptural gesture over there, and then the city is built up almost around it. Whereas in contexts such as an inner city or an existing campus, uh, both the artist and the architect, uh, as well as those of us who work in museums, are really uh, asked to enter into a, a dialogue that doesn't necessarily have an easy algorithm uh, as an answer. It, it's a process of sort of excavating or, or mining for possible solutions. And you open one door, and you, you discover something behind it that you didn't expect. Well, did you have? As, as this exhibition came to be, Mark, did, did that sort of notion of discovery play itself out? Um, maybe reading, I mean, I really went into the artists and thinking about uh, kind of Clifford Still's manifestos. I read a lot of, about just kind of his thinking and what he thought. That's really, so it really was more mining the, 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 the writings around the, the work. That, that's really more of what I ex excavated is not actually the building itself, but more of the, the, the excavating and kind of interrogating the, the writing. That was really more what I was interested in. Yeah, the museum is nowadays, it's inevitable to have a, you know, extension. As an architect, almost all the museum projects I worked on is all extensions. Mm. And I think that the uh, art form is also thrive, I mean, demanding the diversity and the range of spaces. Yeah. And I think that's becoming almost like essential. And in your museum, and also here, you also, on top of that, I think in architecture history, we are at the very interesting moment where landscape and urban built form is becoming more and more truly integrated. And I think the art field, like where you actually exhibit art, also is becoming diversified. So in that sense, um, the extension and discovery of the old, but you know that uh, also you have a potential to integrate it to the landscape, which um, is quite a you know uh, very rich, rich uh, context you have. So let's ask this question then. Uh, we put a lot of effort into these endeavors, uh, you know, fundraising and solidifying support and dealing with the media and you know trying to, in a sense, uh, do the right thing, if you wish. And since we're doing it, it begs the question: Why are we doing it? And the question is: What is the purpose? of these institutions for the 21st century? Why are we engaged with them? Why is it important to have uh, art museums? Or is it? Um, if I may yeah, start. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, In the architecture, as an architect and observer, I did this uh, research about uh, how post Bilbao, what's the kind of trend that I'm facing? You know, that Bilbao, of course, made a lot of American museums and all the institutions quite wealthy. And that uh, also created a very, lot of powerful <laughs> individuals uh, that are artists uh, themselves or curators or gallery. But what's happening now, uh, I think that Bilbao effect is kind of, of course, dying because the investment you make to a, a very iconic museum can only uh, provide a certain uh, limited amount of space and uh, program that uh, cannot really cater anymore to the diversity of the art expressions. So this is an investigation I did uh, uh, called Perennials. It's about uh, uh, how many uh, biennials are there in 2013, and that was already 196 biennials. So that means uh, in September only, there were like 22 biennials happening at the same time in the world. And I think that's a very interesting trend where the, the iconic architecture, a very tangible form, is kind of moving into more event-based or more ephemeral uh, kind of 
form because that can also regenerate itself quite easily. It's not about the initial investment that lasts like 100 years, but this is a kind of ongoing uh, effort. So I think that uh, that's why I think Albert Knox's uh, ambition is also not to just have a gallery space, but a lot of programmed uh, outreach to public and event or uh, such. So I guess the maybe 21st century museum should also have probably this range of um, spaces and initiatives that can uh, react to the diversity. Yeah, I agree. And, and this, Mark, of I course, agree. is something that you know, art and practice mm -hmm. uh, in Los Angeles is, is, while it is totally integrated with the art, but it is about the community and foster youth and jobs and, and things that are very pragmatic in the life of people. I think it would be, you know, and we certainly have, you know, my team and I and, and the board have very much drawn inspiration uh, from your uh, sort of pioneering project uh, uh, in LA. Would be interesting to, to share maybe a few yeah. words about that. Well, I, I, I believe, you know, I believe in what we do. I believe in contemporary art. I don't have any, I, I, I'm an artist and I'm, I'm a contemporary artist, so I don't, I don't really question that. And I think, uh, public institutions that protect and house art and and are able to move into the 21st century. I don't. I think that that's a healthy thing. I think that if a museum chooses to have more of a civicness or socialness, I think that really has to do with institution to institution. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna. I wouldn't penalize an institution if they choose not to kind of reanimate or rethink it. Mm -hmm. I find that I agree. I think that it's artists. There are artists more and more that are interested in this kind of um, bridge building between kind of a civicness and a or socialness and kind of contemporary art or the houses that we house it in. Um, I simply just put two things together that I felt were of urgency to me. I felt like the ideas around contemporary art, not necessarily the objects, but the ideas and around the makers of, I found that th that, that would be interesting to share with the local community. I don't think that oftentimes enough of what the ideas that our artists are really putting on the table are, are shared, they, they can be shared larger. The ideas can be shared with a larger community. So I thought, well, just, expo just, exp just expose the local community to contemporary ideas through objects. And so that was simply bringing those ideas to a local community so that on their way to the store or on their way to the bus stop, they can stop in and they can experience possibly something that is new to them or possibly something that's vaguely familiar. But it also can maybe change the relationship to, of what local people think is and can be art what it looks like, what's the content of it. If it's always just we're getting, we're loading up middle class, working class, and poor people and putting them on buses and taking them outside of their communities, oftentimes if, the, if what they're seeing outside of their community starts to match what's in their communities, then it starts to break down who it belongs to. So I have a partnership with the Hammer Museum and there, there's some, Hammer Museum is in Westwood, California. It's a small, mid-range museum. And, and um, it's great because we will have, sh we will have exhibitions concurrently, one at Art and Practice and one at the museum. And there will be kind of traffic between the two. But what, is, what they're viewing, what the citizens are viewing, is not different. Because I don't, I believe in what I do. I don't believe it's for any group or any class. I don't believe it has to be dumbed down or changed or made more, you know, urban. You know, I have to use a graffiti font for them to get it. I don't believe in any of that. I just do, I believe in what we do. I wouldn't be an artist if, I, actually, I was in New Orleans built, making a work and I was standing in the middle of the street after Hurricane Katrina, and I was talking with a woman, and I said, you know, I don't know if I should be doing this. And, and she was the one that says, well, this is what you do, right? And I said, yeah, this is what I do. And she said, well, then do it. <laughs> you know, sometimes people can be much, we can, if we believe in what we do, we should do it. 
So art and practice, but for me, I felt like it would be interesting to engage another population. So in that area, um, orphans or, or children without families are epidemic. So I thought it would be interesting as an experiment to put for them to be neighbors. And, and, and that is what I did. I put one neighbor next to another neighbor. You can have a Muslim family next to a Christian family, and, and just because of their next door neighbors, things happen. So that's what I thought. You put them together. Of course, they have different needs. You have different, there's a different platform. But neighbors eventually start to understand each other on some level. Yeah. And that's, I didn't, that's all I did. So it's the same thing, I think, at, um, um, I, I'll go back to um, the hammer because I've had the longest, yeah. and there was some show that was happening, I think, at both Art and Practice and the Hammer Museum, and there was a Thursday night, and it was a very diverse crowd, and it was very packed, and were, these were new visitors, and I remember talking to Annie and sort of saying, well, do you think it's because the relationship with Art and Practice, or do you think it's because the hammer's been, you know, getting up? And, you know, we, we all kind of came up with, we're not sure. Mm. But, but, but we were hopeful that it was. You can't quantify everything. Right. No, I think that that's such an interesting point that you raise, and especially the notion of that's what we do. Because, you know, when I, there aren't too many European museum directors in the States, and the reason there aren't that many is because oftentimes American boards think, board of directors, believe that you know, in Europe all the money comes from the government, so European museum directors won't know how to fundraise. Well, uh, <laughs> we are experimenting with that now, and <laughs> Buffalo is an experimental town. Um, but when I uh, came, uh, I had been in, a museum director in Finland. I was the youngest museum director uh, when I started in 2004. And uh, I ran two different museums, most recently the Helsinki Art Museum, for six years. And one thing that I did was run the public art programs uh, first for the city of Tampere and then for the city of Helsinki. And I had an entire department dedicated to public art, meaning every time a hospital would go up, we would curate uh, the hospital floors or a new school or a bridge. Uh, you know, we would be the kind of uh, artistic curator, curatorial force in that sense. So when I came to Buffalo, I walked to the county executive office and I said, you know, we should really consider this notion of public art and it hadn't had been unheard of. So I said, you know, how about this? I double your dollar that if you pay for the curator's salary, I will double, or the Albright Knox will double that money uh, in, in the realm of public art. And we started three years ago, and it has become one of the most transformative initiatives in Western New York. And people who had nothing to do with the museum are now becoming neighbors of ours, not always inside the museum, but in some part of town where one of our projects goes up, and often these projects are ephemeral, meaning that they, it's not like a bronze statue that we plant somewhere, but it's, it's a project that maybe lasts, it can be performative or it can be participatory. And I think that has certainly opened new doors of discovery for, for all of us who've been involved with it. But it's not as safe. No. You know, and not. that I like. There, there is this idea that, okay, we can bridge and we can develop new collaborations and new partnerships, but as you move out of your comfort zone, or as you move out of, yeah, your, our comfort zone, they're going to have a completely different set of conditions. And it's not going to be as safe. And that's just a different type of set of tools that you have to apply. I don't think it, um, it's good or bad or right or wrong. It's just simply if, it's, if, if we choose to engage in that kind of population or or not, right. and I chose to do this program, and it, it wasn't always easy, and it was, it was hostile sometimes. We had run-ins, we had um, the local community telling me, you know, it's very race-based, uh, kind of black looks like this, and I don't always have the same friends of the same color or the same gender, and what does that look like to bring other racially different people into an all-anything community. There's going to be pushback. There's going to be negotiations. It's not always easy. It wasn't always easy. But I believed in the, I believed in the fundamental practice. And you just have to kind of 
navigate it. But at no time did I ever change what I believed in. I, I never, that, I think that's the core, is to stay constant. If you change for sort of the local community or the, muse or the museum world, that's where it starts to break down. I think right. that even arts education can even kind of take a page out of just kind of staying consistent and just moving through different sites, but not changing kind of the core of what we, what we do. But is that a specificity issue? Like the, you know, you work with community and within a limited, uh, or within a, their home ground, and then actually conceive an art that is highly specific to that, um, you know, culture. No, no, I, no not necessarily. I, no, well, you know, I, I really don't like the word community because it implies that there's like this, this like that's a little bit. But I've had a long history with this local community as a merchant. Now, what, which was interesting, isn't it? Let me, had, being in a local community as a merchant in an all kind of, it was all, you know, black community. I was a local, I was a hairstylist, which has a very, specific place in the community, let's just put it that way. Mm -hmm. And to sort of, to expand, so I came back, I was a hairdresser first, and then I had my art studio there, and then, then I became this foundation, which I was doing contemporary art and working with. So what happened was, is that me, Mark, kept changing, this fluidity that I was talking about. And it be, I think that that becomes very important, is that race and fluidity are something that in the US we're less comfortable with. I think it's kind of, we understand what blackness is and Japanese culture, but it's, almost, it's always a stereotype that presents you. Mm -hmm. So this idea that having race and fluidity mm -hmm. is something that I'm very much interested in is because you, we need to understand that you can have a room full of all the same race, or all the same gender, and there's as many different and, there, and there's as many different ideas as any other group. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I, that was the main thing about Lemur Park is that yes, I am black <laughs> and you are black, but that doesn't mean that me and you are going to agree. Mm -hmm. and, we, and that's okay. Yeah. You know, so this plurality from within mm -hmm. is really a, a kind of a thing that. But I think it was interesting to go through the spaces of art and practice where you know, we visited mm -hmm. with, uh, with uh, some museum directors back in January. And I think that what was particularly interesting was that because it's sort of part of the urban plan and you have mm -hmm. this ability to poke your nose into a space, yeah. at least we had that opportunity. I don't know, of course, how others would experience this, but the, the notion that you sort of slip in and slip out in an unchoreographed manner, generated the sense of um, that you're not entering something or someone, but you are more in an open-ended dialogue. And one of the things that we have been sort of questioning and one of the challenges that Shohei and his team will have is how do you create spaces that enable that to happen? Because those of you who've been to Buffalo who have seen images um, of the museum, you know, Bunshaft's high modernist building uh, is uh, a, a beautiful geometric form, and it, it, it stands at an elegant distance in terms of the black uh, auditorium cube from the, from the marble edifice. But it also is a little bit of a wall, and the park used to be more porous. You used to be able to sort of walk around and explore the campus in a different way. So in order to create that sense of possibility or porousness into a wall of whiteness, uh, no pun intended, uh, I think is a challenge for someone. Because at the same time, as Sho and his team will be concerned of histo with historic preservation questions, they need to kind of tackle the functional and pragmatic questions that we are dealing with today as a museum and also as an ensemble of, of, of people. You want to say something about that show? Mm. <laughs> that the notion of, <laughs> of editing the history or revisiting it and? Or like make the experience of the museum like the urban 
expands like the art and practice? Or is that, is that right? I mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is that how do, does one, as an architect, engage something as as sort of uh, binary, if you wish, as, as this? How do you? I don't want to use a simple word, add, but you know, in lack of something better for now. I mean, how, how do you write a new chapter in, into a context of a campus that has a certain identity now? I mean, certainly the Albright, the 1905 building, had a certain identity. And then something was added to it or appended to it. And again, we are at the precipice of, of that kind of a question. As an architect uh, without any site, basically what he's saying is that we don't, he doesn't really have any site defined. And I, I think that's a very difficult start because architects are really used to be given a framework, at least a site and the regulation to start with. But here, uh, it was quite open-ended. You know, they had a range also on the size. Also, the ratio of art space versus non-art space was also kind of... Uh, free. So at that moment, it was, you know, full of possibility, but very difficult uh, project. So I, I think the citing, I mean, something to add, uh, of course, where you add uh, will be the first question. And I think that's, that's a kind of lux luxurious question uh, in a way, but um, that will also dictate the future, uh, the dialogue to the old, but also the kind of, you know, the, the future image. Uh, of the museum. But also, again, the landscape and architecture can maybe be integrated so that uh, maybe addition might not look like an, an addition in the end. That's also <laughs> one direction. But anyway, we, we have such a range of uh, response that uh, could happen. And well, the only, uh, I think that the great thing about your project, your, your museum is already have some level of diversity. And whatever we add, it will create some kind of urban condition like the you know, slightly more spontaneous um, uh, circulation could happen. Well, that, that's, that's what yeah. I'm wishing. Yeah. That's, that's a good thing about uh, extension, that you are at least have a nice uh, old building, <laughs> even if you fail. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, which I'm not supposed to say before it starts, but yeah. <laughs> um, folks, we have about 10 minutes for, for Q&A. Um, shall we take some dialogue? Yeah, yeah please. I have a question for, um, There's a microphone right next to you. Thank you so much. Hello, that was interesting and wonderful. And I have a question for Sho. Yeah. Um, how would your addition like, influenced the show as re being read the Mark Bradford and Clifford Still show. How could the architecture like, change the reading of the pieces? As far as what can architecture contribute in a museum setting sort of like, with this particular show? The current show or the potential whatever show that Mark will? <coughs> current show. If you take that as an example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is one thing I learned that uh, that's not an answer that architects should answer, but maybe an artist should answer. <laughs> because and this is one thing I've learned is that I, you know, that's the kind of question that an artist can't answer, and maybe an architect can answer. <laughs> all right, all right, let's play it together. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. All right, okay. I'll say the things I hate. I hate when an architect takes over. I feel like breathing down the architect's neck instead of really the, the, the space is made for the artwork. That I have to grapple with the vision instead of trying to grapple with the work sometimes. Mm. I've worked in spaces where it's like, Jesus Christ, the art, architect's ego is everywhere. How mm. am I supposed to compete? Mm. It's almost like my feathers flop, mm. you know? So, um, I think that that period is, uh, that's what I was trying to say with the um, Bilbao effect going to end. And I think the art world is much more interested in spontaneous and non-protentious non spaces. And I mean, this museum is the best example yeah. in the world. Um, so that will never happen. Flexibility. Probably. Yeah, yeah, flexibility yeah. and also neutrality. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what architects should focus 
nowadays is that how we, I mean, so there is a certain level of standard to make the art shine. So I think we can easily do that. But for me, what's interesting is to make other spaces in the museum because, you know, nowadays, like, only one third is the gallery space and the rest of the museum is non-art space sometimes. So as an architect, how to integrate the experience of art space and non-art space into and inspire artists, not in the, try not to inspire art, uh, artists through a gallery space, but through non-art uh, space. And I think that's, that could be uh, the way to uh, make his exhibition even more um, credible uh, and interesting. Yes. There's a mic coming back behind you. Hello. Uh, have, have any of you gentlemen thought of adding an interactive element to the museums that you plan on in the future or have planned in the past, say, uh, in terms of this transgenerational um, focus. I see kids, you know, sometimes not interested in museums, but if you add an interactive element, a la Rudolf Stengel, where kids could, you know, make art as well as look at art, you might be able to bridge a lot more gaps. Yeah. Um. I can kick this one off by saying that a lot of the projects that we do are, are interactive in terms of, um, for example, some of the public artworks that we've done. We've actually invited the community to join the artists in the making of those murals or in the actual creation uh, uh, of them. I, I think that that is an increasingly uh, typical practice to, to our time. It's, it's not so much anymore about the single, only about the individual genius, but it can have that participatory element. Also, I think as a European uh, who now works in the US, one of the, the great things I find in American museums is this notion of who gives the gallery tours. You know, I have uh, 100 docents who are volunteers. Many of them are, are, are people who have retired from professional life. Uh, but they give the tours uh, to kids between the ages of, of, of 5 and 18, to school groups effectively. So there's this interesting intergenerational dialogue that happens between these volunteers um, and, and kids from different walks of life. And it, it sort of is a dynamic that, at least in Scandinavia, it's not that common. Maybe it exists a little bit here and there, but it's not sort of we have uh, you know, people we employ as, as, as museum guides. So I think that uh, the notion of participating on a volunteer basis adds, is one way of sort of adding an interesting element of dialogue into the function of museums. Well, for me, the interactiveness sometimes is misunderstood as if that's a kind of, I, I guess what you mean is more technological interactiveness or in, inter, interactiveness in general. Or tactile interactivity right. might even be better. Right. I mean, that's why, again, nature for me is always kind of interesting ground to have an interactiveness because, you know, as a kid, of course, you grew, grow up in the nature and you learn how to interact. Um, so that's why this the, expanding the territory, not only in the building and not in the kind of artwork, but expanding to a larger campus is, for me, is a very interesting potential for the interactivity. And I think as an architect, again, to try to there are two ways, I think. Um, I've been working with, collaborating with artists and conceive new typology, like Marina Abramovich, we're doing a theater in upstate New York for dedicated for long duration of performance. I mean, there she has a craziest idea that the rule itself is that any performance that happens in the building needs to be six, more than six hours. <laughs> so, so, so that way you can't conceive, you can't even design a typical theater because as an architect, no one wants to sit like this for six hours. So um, that kind of uh, collaboration with an uh, artist and coming up with a specific response could create, a, in a way, a very interactive uh, space, potentially, because it kind of pushes you to uh, expand the notion of flexibility and, uh, and such. As an artist, I actually, I'm, I'm 
I think um, I, sometimes this idea of look, everything looking through screens for me, it's sort of interactive and kind of, it, it, it keeps, especially the younger people, amped up and they just kind of want instant gratification. This, I actually think the opposite, kind of slowing it down. Hmm. Um, just kind of looking and kind of finding their own imagination within what they're looking at instead of um, looking at a screen kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of mimicking what they're used to in their lives already. It's kind of using the same tools and you're not really um, looking at a painting on an iPad or and looking at a work, just a work in, in physical, there's just different, yeah. different relationships and it just, it requires a different type of looking. I don't think it's necessarily, oh, that's just an old fashioned way of thinking about it. Things move rapidly, but things can move so rapidly they don't move at all. I mean, it's not, it's not. So I, um, I actually, if I'm working with younger, young people, especially with kids, I always will tell them just the opposite. Like, um, just stare at that. You know, just stare at it for a while. And then sometimes I'll say, well, if you stare long enough and you look at the white wall, you'll be able to reflect. And then they kind of, but like using, like activating their imagination. I think that's why windows are actually very important in a museum. What we've discovered, and I'm sure many of you here tonight will, will realize this as you walk around the galleries, as important and as gratifying as it is to look at a work of art, the ability to palette cleanse your optical sense by looking at a landscape and then to return to a work of art actually enriches the experience. And in Finland, when we ran a, a little bit of a focus group with kids, this pertains to the technology question. Uh, this was, I was engaged with an international museum project in Helsinki for some years, and we, we were sure that we, we took these high school kids uh, from different public high schools in Helsinki, and we sort of wanted them to have an open-ended conversation of what they wanted the museum of the 21st century to be. And myself and many others who were sort of uh, planning uh, these focus groups were sure that we were going to hear a lot about technology and how technology should be integrated into the museum of the future. On the contrary, the kids and the, the, you know, the young people participating basically said, just keep the space technology free, that there's sort of enough of it elsewhere. And, and, and the museum should not go into that. And it was an astonishing discovery for us. And again, this is a little bit country specific. I mean, Finland has probably at that time had the highest saturation of cell phones per capita. You know, <laughs> Finland known as Nokia land also formally. It's like the artist formerly known as. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, when I work at art and practice a lot of the times, I, what I realize is I think even when, when I would do classes at museums or I would do classes, uh, it's almost like we're, we, we over fetishize um, young people being bored. We're so afraid that young people are going to be bored. Oh, I'm bored. So what? <laughs> you know? So what? I mean, figure it out. I mean, it's like, you know, so we're just so afri afraid of hearing those words. Well, I'm bored. I'm bored. We don't want them to be bored in the museums. We don't want them to be bored at home. We don't want them to be bored. We're so afraid that we're filling it with this, like, stimuli so that they're not bored. Well, I think on the other side of boredom is imagination. And so I don't, I really, I, so figure it out. I mean, you know, it's what did we do before when we're taking long road trips? If you, you, you sort of just kind of figure it out. So I think it's kind of you have to find a healthy balance uh, in, in, in kind of the kind of visualization, kind of like looking at works of art and, and, and kind of interacting, I think. So if this, we all kind of answered the same question, I guess. <laughs> I think we had a question over there. Yeah? Oh. I have a question to Mark. Um, I know you've had so many shows at different museums and um, galleries, but most of the time I believe uh, all those spaces are white cubes. Um, my question for you is, if you can design a space or if you can pick a location where you can display your artwork and you can become a curator as well, oh. what will be an ideal location or environment that you want to display your artwork? Great question. I don't have to. 
You're real shady. <laughs> uh, uh, well, you know, that's a big question. But I've been spending a lot of time in Venice, and I've always had um, just a, a profound interest from as a child uh, with churches, Gothic churches, uh, shotgun churches. I've always loved places of worship. I've always loved them. Um, and surprisingly enough, convents. I, know, I think it's maybe because of the vaultingness of the largest of the, the, the kind of impenetrableness of God and the, impen, the impenetrableness of the. So it would probably be, and of course, to yeah, it'd be a church. I think this kind of this kind of um, uh, places of worship because they have this kind of historical. Unease if you um, mess it up. I mean, it's like if you mess it up, there's this kind of social outcry, how could you? And I kind of like that. It's kind of tiptoeing around the idea that of kind of messing with tradition a little bit. So I think it's always this, the places of worship, not to, not to make them sacrilegious or anything, mm -hmm. but just to reanimate them possibly in a different way. I, I had a show in Shanghai um, at I can't remember the places, but across the street there was a, used to be a church, and then it was gutted, and it was made into a, um, like a center, a youth center. And I really wanted to do something. I couldn't do something at the time, but you could see it had all the bones of this, this church. And I liked the idea that it was gutted, then it became a soap factory, and then it became a, so I like that. So it would probably be, a, and then I, of course, even if you're, not religious, and I would say if you're black, you're born into religion, even if you're not religious. It's just kind of like the DNA, you know? So, a church. Which one is your favorite museum? I don't, ha I don't have a favorite museum. Well, but the, in the interview process, they asked me. Yeah. Which... And you probably said, the Albright Knox. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's a very tough question. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, he he yeah. answered very intelligently uh, without <laughs> exactly answering. Uh, uh, huh. <laughs> it was a little shady. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. I want to thank Sam Keller and his amazing team.